right. Good deal. Let's take a moment, center into that inner teacher. Mother, Father, God, we know who the true teacher is. It's the Christ within each of us, so we tune in and listen. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, this month of February, we are focusing on compassion. And our overall theme for 2017 here at Unity of Austin is Unity's Expression of Christianity, Understanding Christianity as a Universal Principle of Spirituality. And we follow that Jesus Christ path, His life and teachings, and we understand them as universal. So people call their spiritual path by many things, and we respect everybody's path. And uh, we're here to understand that and to live and practice these spiritual principles. So... We are, when we use our affirmation here every Sunday, what we're doing is really we are engaging in what in unity we call the creative process. We, and we're talking about this in our Wednesday night class. So, uh, What we're doing is that we are aligning ourselves as individual expressions of God with what we talk about as universal mind or with Mother, Father, God. And so we're coming from that place of uh, the universal creativeness source, God, divine mind, and we are saying, I'm claiming that, I'm seeing it coming through me, and I'm going to align myself with it in the way I think and the way I act. So, therefore, that's why we can say every Sunday, when we affirm this, we're not trying to make it true because it is true. All right, so let's align with this, and it's a long one, and you can do whatever hand motions you want. I'll do mine. Okay, so here we go. We're getting, and we're, we're getting this. Okay, so every person is seeking to express the highest and best. I open my heart in compassion. All right, good. I love it. Y'all are creative out there. Got some good hand ones. It's good. Okay, so here, we can play with this. We can do it. We can do whatever we want. How about that? Okay, so let's align with it again. Here we go. Every person is seeking to express the highest and best. I open my heart in compassion. Oh, I like that. All right. We get that and let's align with it the third time. Every person is seeking to express the highest and best. I open my heart in compassion. I believe you. I feel that love. Now, if you'd like to, turn to somebody next to you and affirm this for them using you, if you want to. All right, I feel that love light turning up in here. It's good, good stuff. All right, I got a story for you. All right, there was this woman who um, always felt intimidated when she had to take her car to get it fixed because she felt like she never could describe it correctly and she felt like, you know, she, she was just always upsetting to her and she felt very, very inadequate around her car. So her car was... Um, not doing the right, wasn't doing right, so she thought, well, this time, before, I'm not just going to take it into the shop. First, I'm going to get this friend of mine who knows about cars, and I'm going to ask him to drive it around and then sort of tell me how I can explain it and feel some sense of dignity and self-respect when I go to take it into the shop. So she did, so her friend drove it around, and, and uh, he, said, he said, okay, he said, this is what you tell him. He said, when you take it in, tell him this. Tell him that the timing is off, Therefore, it is creating premature detonations, which could damage the valves. <laughs> so she rehearses this. So she takes it in, and, and she's talking with the mechanic, and he says, you know, how, what can I, what's going on? And she says, the timing is off. It is um, creating uh, premature detonations, which could damage the valves. And she was very proud of herself and kind of looking like, hey, I'm good. 
So she kind of looks over her shoulder while he's writing it down, and she saw that what he actually wrote on the, the paper there that he had to write to make the work order is, lady says her car's making funny noises. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, you know what? The best thing is just to be direct, right? And just tell it like it is. We don't have to get fancy about anything. Uh, we do sometimes, but we don't have to because life's pretty simple, really. And when we just get down to it and what's really going on and just talk about that, then usually what that does is it puts us in a position to open up to some solutions and to just get things done. And nowhere is this more true or more important than those relationships that we have with other people, right? We just got to get honest, and we just got to tell it like it is. And that's going to open up some space for solutions. I am guessing that most of us here have had or perhaps are having the experience of feeling like you are in some kind of a death grip tangle with somebody else, right? You ever had that feeling? Like I am just upset with them, I'm wrapped around the axle in my own mind and maybe with them it's like I just, I just like can't we just get this thing solved and why can't you just do it my way and all of that, right? And when we do that, of course, what happens is that we get so constricted. We get so tight and we get so tightly wrapped around it with them that we know what happens, right? You get a headache <laughs> or you get so wound up in your mind and your mind's just going round and round and round. And let me ask you this, is it having new and creative thoughts? No, it is not. <laughs> It is rehearsing the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. And we get locked into it and we are so tightened up that we are just living in fear and it can breed resentment and hatred and all this stuff that just gets the hardening of the attitudes, right? We just get so locked into that that we can't get out of it. And we're saying to ourselves, but I'm not letting this thing go because there's so much injustice here. It was wrong. What they did was wrong, and it shouldn't be. And I'm going to hold on to this until they get the point. <laughs> and I'm asking you, has it worked? <laughs> no, it has not. And I have tried. I tell you, I have tried. Okay, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. So Jesus had, and it, it doesn't mean that st st stuff didn't happen. Probably something unjust did happen. You know, life happens. There's a lot of things that go on. We know that. It's not just. It's not right. Doesn't mean you have to say it's right or it's just or that you liked it or that it's a good thing. No, you don't have to say that because lots of stuff goes on in the world of experience. It's just the deal is if we want to resolve it, if we want to get something different, we're going to have to do something different. And Jesus had an amazing insight about that. And he said, give love in return for error. Well, I'm not going to do that. No, sir. Give love in return for error. Because when you give love in return for error, what happens is not that you're like saying it was all okay and, and all that, but what happens is that you're able to go <sighs> and take a breath and start to let go of that grip and it makes some space, right? So what we're doing is when we give love in return for error, when we open our minds and our hearts to the reality of love, which is a spiritual principle, which is God nature, then what happens is we start making some room and we are coming now into that circumstance and that situation in a completely different consciousness. We're coming in a completely different mode. We're coming in a completely different energy field. And what happens is it makes room for there to be solution. It makes room that we can all go forward instead of all sitting there. I mean, I just sometimes have this image of we're all like wrestlers, you know, uh, just sort of there in these grips with other people and nobody's getting anywhere. So when we start letting that go, then we are in the place of moving forward. We're in the place of opening up to flow. 
There's a great uh, quote from Rumi, who was the uh, Sufi mystic, and, and Sufism is the uh, mystical branch of Islam, and he was a 13th century Sufi uh, poet, and um, as you probably know, he's been very popular. Some people say he's the most popular poet in America, and he was, you know, in the 13th century. <laughs> it's true. He's, he has many wonderful things to, that he wrote. So he's got a wonderful uh, thought, and it's this one. Out beyond the field of wrongdoing and rightdoing, there, out, excuse me, out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and rightdoing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. Out beyond the ideas of right doing and wrong doing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. That's the only real place we can meet people, right? That's it. That's the deal. That's the only place where we can meet people. So that's the opportunity that we have. It, and you know, when, it, when there's a situation where there's great darkness or where there's great constriction, the, the spiritual reason for that, or the underpinning, is because in that circumstance, in that situation, people have lost touch with the consciousness of love. Because when you know the power of almighty love, you have no interest in doing that. It's just not even reality. You're not living in that universe. You're living in that Rumi's field when you're in the consciousness of love. So any place in your life or any place that you see in the community or in the world where there seems to be great darkness or great uh, moral uh, lostness, that's the place to say, okay, how, God, can I be the consciousness of almighty love in this circumstance, in this situation? How can I know love in this particular place and time? How can my mind and my heart be a conduit for the love that is all here, all there, and see that love in myself, in others, and move from that love? When we do that, we then are beginning the process of opening up space, of bringing in the consciousness of almighty love. Not just love. What kind of love? Almighty. almighty love. And that's the truth. That is the absolute truth, for that is who we are. And love is about oneness. Love is about oneness. Jesus put it this way. You know, Jesus, well, I'm, I'm going to read this to you before I go there. Emmett Fox. Again, I've been quoting Emmett Fox. I'm reading him again, and he's wonderful. Emmett Fox, a great uh, metaphysician in the early uh, part of the, the, uh, those old days, the 20th century. <laughs> um, he was a friend of unity and, and, a, and a metaphysician, certainly in his own right. A very wise person. And I'm going to share something with you that, that he wrote. He's writing about the Lord's Prayer. He says, now the prayer says, not my father, but our father. And this indicates beyond the possibility of mistake, the truth of the brotherhood, and he wrote this a long time ago, so he wasn't using gender neutral language, okay? Anyway, be, the truth of the brotherhood of man. It forces upon our attention at the very beginning the fact that all people are the children of one father. And that, and he's quoting now from the scripture from Galatians, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, you're all one in Christ. And then he goes on. He says, here Jesus cuts away the illusion that the members of any nation or race or territory or group or class or color are in the sight of God superior to any other group. He says, get over it. No, he didn't say that. The final point is the implied command that we are to pray not only for ourselves, but for all mankind. None of us lives to himself, however we may try. In a much more literal sense than people are aware, we are limbs of one body. It's not just some little nice little, you know, metaphor. We really are expressions of the one mind and the one presence. We're all necessary. So... Our Father, he says, is a spiritual explosive that will ultimately destroy every kind of human bondage. Wow. It's powerful. The concept, the word, the living, our Father. I love it. He says, he doesn't just say it's a nice thing to say. He says, it's a what? An explosive that will release every bondage 
that we human beings put ourselves in, in this outer way. That's what we're called to do. That's what we're here for, is to live that, to live our father, our mother, to live that we are all one, that we are expressions of the one, and to do what it takes to make that happen. Jesus had some very concrete ideas about how you do that, and I would like to share those with you. And this is in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, starting with verse 27. So, he says, But I say to you that, listen, love your enemies, and do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other one also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away from your goods, don't ask them for them again. Do unto others as you'd have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even the sinners love those who love them. I like that. He's like, you don't get any brownie points for that. Okay. <laughs> Okay. He says, if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even the sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Who does that? The sinners do, right? Even the sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your father is merciful. Wow. That's the deal. That's how you do it. It's very practical, isn't it? So on that spiritual level, with that understanding, it's about not uh, living in this, this mean little world of even exchange. It's about no. I'm going to be greater than that because I am greater than that. It's not like I'm going I'm to be bigger than that. You are bigger than that. And so we get the opportunity to live like that. That doesn't mean that you don't have any boundaries. It's not about letting everybody run over you and giving away every penny of your money. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about at the level of heart is making choice to how am I going to treat people? How am I going to interact? What am I going to do when all the time and certainly what am I going to do when life happens I'm going to come to it with a big heart with a compassionate heart with an understanding that we're all one so I'm not going to whack them back if they whack me I'm going to do something better than that I'm going to be who I am here and I'm going to find a way to be love in that place to be a self and from that self to give forth love why because it works because it works it sets me free, it sets them free, it makes space for love in this world, and it elevates truly our consciousness. It gives us that flow of love. I want to share with you this story. It's a hard story, but I'm going to share it with you. And it's uh, the story of the forgiving mother. And it's from, uh, uh, you can look it up on the web, and there are many other uh, stories from the Forgiveness Project which has lots of stories of forgiveness. And forgiveness in a spiritual understanding is giving love in return for error. It has nothing to do with pardon. It has nothing to do with it wasn't that bad. It's simply about whatever happened, I'm willing to, to be who I am and give forth love. So here's this beautiful story. This woman's name is Scarlett Lewis, and her son, Jesse, was one of the little children who was uh, killed at Sandy Hook Elementary School in 2012 and we know that that was a horrible tragedy and it was the biggest uh, loss it was the biggest school shooting the most people lost their lives in the history of the United States and so she says uh, at first she felt that she that her anger had sapped her of all of her strength and energy and she was certainly angry at the shooter and she was angry at the shooter's mother who had apparently facilitated him getting the weapons um, to do what he did so she goes on, and this is what she has to say about what happened in her life after that. Of course, she was in incredible grief. And she says, forgiveness is central to my resilience. She said, a social worker came to my house shortly after the incident. And kneeling down with her hand on my knee, the social worker said, I know how it feels. I lost my son, and I'm here to tell you that the pain will never get better. 
Well, Scarlett Lewis said to herself, she said, at that moment, I thought, that is absolutely not going to be my journey. I'm not going to do that. She said, so I chose instead the path of forgiveness. She said, initially, it felt as if the shooter was attached to me by some umbilical cord and all my energy was being sapped. That's an apt ex uh, description, is it not? When we're tied to somebody in, uh, in anger and whatever. Again, doesn't mean what happened was good. Certainly she had to feel that anger first. And then after a while, it's like, okay, now what's happening to me? How can I move through this and come into a different experience of this situation? Because it, it's destroying her. So she said, forgiveness felt like I was given a big pair of scissors to cut the tie and regain my personal power. It started with a choice, and then it became a process that has no neat ending. She said, one day I can forgive, and the next day I might hear a detail of what happened in the classroom, and I feel the anger all over again. But she keeps with the process. So she said, at Jesse's funeral, I urged everyone to choose love rather than hate. And I said, this tragedy started with an angry thought in the shooter's head, which grew to rage and escalated to violence. So please honor Jesse's memory by consciously changing an angry thought into a loving one, and so make this a better world. That's the opportunity that we have. Again, doesn't mean, you know, certainly we have to go through the anger and all such, and it may come back again. The deal is, okay, I'm angry, I get it, I don't like whatever it was that happened, and I get it, I process it, and I move into that consciousness that Jesus talks about. I pray for those who abuse me or anybody else. I see love coming forth. I give with generosity. I be the love, the bigness that I am. For when I do that, when I make those choices, when I take those actions, when I consciously pray, every morning, I invite you to do that, and every night before you go to sleep, is take a moment to give love in return for error for whatever's on your mind that's binding you up. Set yourself free. Take those big scissors that she's talking about and set yourself free and make space. Make space. For when our hearts are full of love, we know what there's not room for, right? There's not any room for that fear. There's not any room for that hate. And we've made the world a better place. Amen. All right, let's pray. So we take a breath and feel that and really let ourselves relax and open. Feeling that love, that forgiveness, that place of peace. And we think about all the people right now in the world that could uh, use a little awareness of love, whoever they are. And we see that love in them flowing through them and knowing that all is well. And we give thanks, God, that we have the opportunity to be love, that we are, to be conscious of it. And so we give thanks for your guidance, for your strength in your life and your light today and every day to keep bringing forth that love so there isn't any more room for fear, no more room for hate. We give thanks that all there is is the consciousness of love. And it is so, and we affirm this through the power of our brother Jesus Christ, who knows love so well, and that Christ that's in us that also knows love so well. Amen. 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 solitary faces working at it hard each day but if they'd stop and take the time to question why they care they might just start to find there's still room for sharing it's like we go around in circles
It's too 